Hello, world. Welcome back to the Simple Sports Podcast. I am back. Week five is in the books. What a week of football we were treated to. A lot of good games took place dating back to last Thursday between the Seahawks and the Rams in a Thursday night football thriller. Seahawks squeaked out a win after the missed field goal by the Rams. It was a great, awesome game. Uh, And I just can't say enough good things about the Seahawks and Russell Wilson, in particular Pete Carroll, doing an awesome job coaching that team up. Um, They just keep their heads down, um, eyes on the prize. And you can – listen, they're not – I don't know if they're the best team in the NFC or the best team in the NFL. I don't think so. Uh, But you can never count them out. That's to say the least. And they're always going to give you an honest day's hard work, and you got to respect that. So hats off to the Seahawks. On the flip side, I can't say nearly enough bad things about the Tennessee Titans. Uh, What an embarrassing performance they put on against the Bills, and even more embarrassing after the game with the Twitter fight between Taylor Lewan and a few of the Bills players. Uh, Roger Saffold keeps speaking out and not performing up to his contract or his position. Uh, he's a large part of why the offensive line is underperforming. They got rid of Quentin Spain and got what I thought would have been an upgrade in Saffold, and it just hasn't worked out. They couldn't protect Mariota to save their lives. And from this point forward, until this team, I'm so sick of discussing this team and their inconsistencies. And so until this team, at a minimum, wins back-to-back games, they will not be on this podcast anymore. So enough ranting for today, uh, for now at least. Today's episode is a shorter one, so let's get right to it. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes football is very simple, okay? A lot of times you have you have to have big plays. Um, you know, you got to get first downs. You got to run the football. You got to be able to move it in the air. Uh, RPOs and all that good stuff. Um, You know, you got to have your coaches scheme up great routes for your wide receivers to get open. Uh, Sometimes you have to have a lucky day, you know, and the ball just bounces your way. A fumble that should have gone out of bounds, maybe just rolled back inside and you recover it, go down and score. Maybe get a block punt or a field goal, run it back for a touchdown. Uh, When your team is struggling, you get some, some life from the special teams unit. Uh, Maybe the other team gets decimated by injuries you know, the field goal kicker misses a few field goals. Those things happen, right? Sometimes you need those things to happen in order for you to be successful. Um, in fact, I don't think you can name a Super Bowl team that at some point didn't have some stretch of luck uh, go their way. You look back at the 17-0 and or 18-0 and Patriots and the David Tyree catch. Um, you can say what you want, but it was a lucky play. And it just, it changed the course of history. Uh, So those things happen. But a lot of Sundays are very, very simple. You just physically beat the piss out of other teams. And that's what we saw on Monday Night Football between the Rams, or excuse me, the Browns and the 49ers. In all, all areas of the game, the return game, the run game, passing, the defense, special teams, whatever, the 49ers lined up. And they beat the Browns silly last night. And that's really all it boiled down to. Now, if you want to, you can point to Baker Mayfield, who pray, played pretty poorly. Uh, turned the ball over a couple of times early. And the pick off Callaway, uh, you know, wasn't his fault necessarily. It could have been a better throw, a slightly better throw. He threw it low. Um, still hit him in the hand. Should have caught it. So I don't, I don't fault him for that. But it was just a summary of the entire night. The Browns, a few different times, were able to move the ball fairly effectively. They were able to drive down the field. In fact, on that drive, they started um, pretty far back, had a couple of decent plays. Nice long drive, and they get down to the red zone, five, six-yard line, whatever it was, and they end up having a pick. And, you know, that pick, which would have given us a a legitimate contest between the two teams at 14-10, to Ended up turning into a 21 to three lead for the 49ers and ultimately 31 to three. Uh, and then the fumble, even before that, was awful because Baker has to realize at a certain point you have to live to fight another day. You don't have to make every play, and he's not the athlete that can go running around, especially with that offensive line that can go running around looking for the next guy. You know, plays broken down. Sometimes you have to take the sack. 
punt it away and live to fight another day, especially early on in the game. It's only a 14. Uh, I think at that point it was 14 to three when he fumbled. I'm not 100 percent sure. I don't remember. It might have been seven to three still. Uh, but regardless, you have a whole nother half of football to play. You got to live to fight another day there. Uh, you can also blame the offensive line who got whooped all night long. The Niners ran stunt after stunt, uh, and they were fairly simple. Tackle in, end out, uh, or excuse me, tackle out, end in. Um, you know, the, the crisscross between uh, Buckner and, and Bosa and all those guys. The Niners ran stunt after stunt, and they got home far too often on the Browns. Bosa was all over the field. Buckner was all over the field. Everybody was. Richard Sherman had a pick, and they had Baker running for his life all night long from six foot four, six foot seven defensive linemen. Balls were getting batted down. Uh, a couple of times they left tight ends to block one on one versus Bosa on the outside, which is just. That just speaks to coaching, and that brings me to my next point. You can easily blame Freddie Kitchens for not being prepared, not having his team prepared, for being in over his head, for game planning to get certain players the ball and not game planning to win the game necessarily. Um, You know, the wide receiver pass with OBJ, that's all good, but to start the game, like, that's a head-scratcher to me. Um, that's a play I think you should be saving for a, if you either need a big play, uh, you know, maybe you're struggling in the game, like in the game, they were, you know, it's 14, three, um, 21 to three, maybe you want to spark some life into your team. That's when you bring out that play potentially. Um, or maybe you just want to get the crowd fired up. You're at home. Uh, they weren't at home last night and, and that sort of speaks to my point, but you're, you know, you're at home. It's a rough game. You want to get the crowd back into it, see if you can regain some home field, home field advantage, um, something like that. Uh, but, at you know, to start the game, that was a little bit of a head scratcher. You abandoned the run game. Nick Chubb was running it, you know, decently. It wasn't He wasn't having a great day, but he was running it well enough that you didn't need to abandon the run game, that's for sure. So, yeah, you can ultimately blame Freddie Kitchens if you want um, for everything that we've seen. And that's not just last night. That's all year. But speaking to last night, this was just a matter of the Niners lining up across from the Browns play after play and whooping them, period, in the story. Their defensive line was in the backfield all night long, and offensively they ran the football down the collective throats of the Browns' defense to the tune of 275 yards. Um, that's a lot. That is a lot of yards. 38 minutes of possession for the Browns. Uh, or excuse me, for the 49ers, to the measly 22 minutes that the Browns had the football. Only 49 offensive plays. That's just not good enough. It was a clinic on how to win football games, and you got to take your hat off to the 49ers um, for that win. I don't wear hats, so I'm moving on. So round two of how to play football features the Colts versus the Chiefs, and the, the Colts pulled off a similar win to the 49ers with their studly offensive line. Those guys are just so good. They're so good. Um, And they ran the Chiefs off the field in Arrowhead to the tune of 180 yards. And ironically, again, just coincidentally, 38 minutes of possession to the 22 minutes for the Chiefs. You can only stop Patrick Mahomes one way, and that's when he's not playing. And that's what the Colts did. They obtained the lead early on. Um, It was still a close game. I mean, it was 10-10 at one point. And they proceeded to push and mush and move the Chiefs defense up and down, left and right, all over the field. At one point in the second half, I believe they ran it something like 14 straight times. And you know what that is? I've played football before. I'm sure a lot of you guys have. When you do something like that, that's a very simple statement. We are bigger and we are stronger and you can't stop it. And that's it. And the Chiefs couldn't. They couldn't stop it. This defense has one playmaker, uh, the Honey Badger, Tyron Matthew, and that's simply not enough. Uh, He's good. He had a pick, big play for them. Um, But one guy on defense isn't going to get it done, especially not a defensive back. Um, You know, even if they had Deion Sanders out there, if if it was Deion Sanders and no one else, that's not going to help your entire defense. Deion Sanders can certainly lock down one side of the field, but – if that's all that you have, there's really not anything there. 
And Tyron Matthew is not Deion Sanders, A. And B, for what he is, um, he's not going to be able to swing that defense so much that they're going to be any better than they were last year. And they're pretty poor. Uh, so best believe in the playoffs, teams like Baltimore, the Patriots, the Colts may be there again. Uh, we'll see how their season pans out. Uh, they'll be doing the exact same thing that the Colts did on Sunday. The Chiefs haven't been able to stop anyone for years, and this year is no different. Uh, they had no answer, no response for the Colts' run game, no answer for the offensive line. Uh, again, you run the ball 14 straight times. That is just a matter of you're not good enough to stop us. You're not big enough. You're not strong enough to stop us. And you can't expect the Chiefs offense to score every single time they touch the football. And with this defense, that's what they need. And it's just not feasible. Uh, they're going to need to score 30 plus points a game for these good teams just for them to be in the game. Um, the defense is terrible. There is a clear formula to beating the Chiefs. Keep Mahomes' butt on the sideline. And that's what the Colts did. They, the Chiefs ran only 57 plays to the Colts' 74 plays with only 20 of those plays, or I guess you have to say with 20 of those coming in the second half. That's just not good enough. That's not nearly good enough to win a Super Bowl. 20 plays in a half, that's normally a quarter for the Chiefs. The, the Colts refused to allow that to happen, and that led them to a win. Um, so we'll see if the Chiefs can improve their defense. My answer is no. So I also watched the Cardinals versus the Bengals. Um, I mean, I watch all the games, but the one I want to talk about is this one. Um, I got two takeaways from this game, two major takeaways. Um, and we're going to start with Kyler Murray and the Cardinals. It was an impressive win, no doubt. Albeit against the lowly Bengals, the Bengals are trash. Um, but they did get a win. Game winning drive in the NFL is not easy for anyone, let alone a first year coach and a first year quarterback. But Kyler Murray does have access to a few to a few tools outside of his arm. And that includes his legs. And that includes the old reliable Larry Fitzgerald. And that's exactly what he is. Old reliable. He's just amazing. Um, Hall of Fame wide receiver. No doubt about it. Um, obviously not what he used to be. But certainly a reliable enough weapon that he's great for Kyler Murray. Um... Here's the thing. Kyler Murray took off a couple of times yesterday, and he looked like the Oklahoma Kyler Murray when he was running the football. It looked like a guy who came to the realization that he doesn't need to prove that he's this pocket passer. We know. We've seen it. He can sling the football. Uh, we've seen that. He's got touch. He's got the velocity on the other end. He's got accuracy. He can throw it deep. He can throw it underneath hit guys in stride, he can throw on the run, whatever you need him to do in terms of throwing the football, he can do it all. Uh, and I'm, I'm amazed, uh, and I say this with respect because of just the guys that we've seen in the past, but for him at his stature, uh, it just amazes me to see the way he slings the football. I would have never expected that. But sometimes as a running quarterback, you need to use your gift, especially early on. Um, you're on a team um you know their offensive line is terrible they don't have the best weapons outside and here's the thing he also doesn't take nasty hits he's not a guy like Vic used to take these brutal hits Cam Newton takes these brutal hits uh he doesn't take those at least not yet and so sometimes it is best to just take off and just go he's got the legs to take it to the house um if he wanted to and I think it's, it was great to see him sort of rely on that a little bit when things broke down rather than try to sit back there and wait and wait for something to, to uh, open up and develop and throw it, throw the football. Uh, he took off and ran almost 400 yards, I think 10 carries for like 93 or 97 yards, something like that. Uh, Sunday's game felt like he came to that conclusion and decided to capitalize, and it was refreshing to see. So hats off to Kyler Murray. On the other side... Um, on the other sideline, what an embarrassment the Cincinnati Bengals are. My God, they have quit already. And if not for the Miami Dolphins, I'd easily have them 32nd in my power rankings. In fact, both teams deserve to be like 33rd and 34th because it's embarrassing. Um, 31 and 32 in the power ranks should just be an empty slot, and they should be at 33 and 34 because it's embarrassing. They have no life. They have no discipline. 
no strategy, no plan. The only reason they were even in that game is because they were playing the Arizona Cardinals, who themselves aren't necessarily a good football team, but they fight, and the Bengals don't. They, they've quit already. It's five weeks in, and they're done. You can put a fork in them. Uh, it's a shame, really, as well, because just remember all those who wanted Marvin Lewis gone. Um, I Listen, I had my issues with Marvin Lewis as well, but remember what the Bengals were before Lewis, and it looked a lot like this. Um, like I said, I had my issues with him as well, but there, here's here's what I do know. If you're going to move on from something or someone, um, make sure you have something competent to replace it, or in this case, him. They don't. Zach Taylor is in far over his head, and that's not to say he won't be a good coach, but he is not, like, this was not the guy to hire for this team. Even if you think he's going to be a great coach someday, he was not the guy to hire for this team. This team is uninspired, untalented, or non-talented, or whatever the proper word would be. And as a result, Zach Taylor appears to be incompetent. Um, and again, I don't necessarily know if it's his fault. It's so difficult to tell because they're such a bad football team. But I can tell you this much. As a football fan, there's nothing more frustrating than watching bad football, and the Bengals are producing nothing but bad football. So, congrats to Kyler Murray, congrats to Cliff Kingsbury, the first win. Good luck to whatever fans the Bengals have left. And that's it, guys. A uh, short episode for this one. However, tomorrow we'll be back for the Week 6 preview. Got a bunch of good games coming up. Uh, we'll dive into those tomorrow. Until then, I'll see you guys. Peace.